Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and you're very welcome to uh, this Open Government Partnership Europe Regional Meeting at Dublin Castle, uh, the opening agenda, uh, the opening session of day one of this two-day uh, two meeting. Um, let me just say about the, the format for this opening session. We have, we have four speakers who are speaking from quite different perspectives, but all with insights on uh, this general agenda, and I'm going to ask each of them uh, to talk to us from their own experience about their insights on this particular uh, agenda. And then they will take just one or two questions immediately after they present. Uh, and if I could just say on that point that if you can find those questions to what you've just heard about, the, you know, about their own country or their own experience, we will then have the same four speakers here as a panel to discuss more general uh, issues. So just on that very first point, when they finish speaking, they will take one or two questions, but make sure that they are not the big macro questions, but just focus on what you've just heard. Uh, could I invite those speakers to come up uh, and join me here uh, on the platform? Um, and as they come up, um, I'm also going to say to you that if you are making a contribution from the floor, try and covet the microphone that is, <clears throat> there are two roving microphones, but covet the microphone not in use so that when I call you, when, I, when you catch my eye, you can wave the microphone at me. I will prioritize those with the microphone because otherwise it takes uh, half a minute just to get the microphones around the room and that slows things down. Um, our opening speaker to open the conference is <clears throat> Brendan Howland, TD, uh, a former Minister for Health and a former Minister for the Environment in Ireland and <clears throat> Ireland's first Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. Uh, he was appointed in March 2011 and the department formally established in July 2011 after our last general election. And as Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, Brendan Howling is committed to ensuring the delivery of two goals for the department, the controlling public expenditure and bringing budgets back to a sustainable path, and on this agenda, ensuring the necessary reforms in how government and the public sector works. But I invite the Minister to open uh, the conference. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, John. As John has set out uh, the two objectives of my department, um, modest objectives, uh, balancing the budget and reforming society. Um, so no great challenge facing uh, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. On behalf of the OGP community in Ireland, I'd like to welcome each of you to this OGP Europe Regional Meeting. I'd like to extend a particular welcome uh, to the ministers, civil society representatives, officials and citizens representing over 30 countries that have traveled here to Dublin Castle for this important meeting. As you know, the Europe Regional Meeting is taking place immediately following the Asia-Pacific Regional Meeting hosted by Indonesia in Bali, highlighting the global reach of the Open Government Partnership. Not sure that Dublin can provide quite the weather of Bali, but I hope we'll, f we'll certainly provide a similar open uh, and robust debate. I know that the key themes that we will be exploring together over the next two days here in Dublin will resonate strongly with those discussed in Bali, notwithstanding the 12,000 kilometers distance between us. I understand that the central objectives of yesterday's Civil Society Day held in the Chester Beatty Library, um, a few moments stroll from where we are here in this meeting uh, venue, coincides with those in Bali and correspond with what will comprise our agenda here at this Europe conference. At the outset, I would like to take the opportunity to share with you why I believe that what we are seeking to do here over the next two days is so important. You will have noticed, certainly the visitors, the election posters on lampposts 
for candidates at the forthcoming local elections and European elections, which are due to be held at the end of this month. The practice of putting up such posters may seem a little strange in today's era of instantaneous contact and communication, but it's a long-established element of our political culture in Ireland, and I think it, it, it's a public statement that something important is happening. It provides a real reminder for us of the ultimate accountability of all political representatives to citizens at the ballot box and the legitimacy of political decision-making flows from the will of the people. It also reinforces the vital message that political legitimacy and the resilience of the democratic system can be enhanced through strong and sustainable engagement with OGP objectives of openness, transparency and accountability. At the recent Open Data to Open Government Conference in Paris, at which the announcement was made of France's intention to become the 64th member of the OGP community, I outlined the main reasons for Ireland's proposed participation in the OGP. In essence, these relate following the collapse of Ireland's banking system and the unprecedented economic turbulence that followed in its wake from, 20, from 2008, to the requirement to rebuild trust and confidence in government, in politics, and in the democratic system itself here in Ireland. The importance of bringing government closer to citizens is a principle understood by both governments and civil society across the world. It's, a, it's fundamental to securing mature and informed public debate. The challenge is, of course, in successfully bringing this about, which leads to the core question for this meeting, which is how can the OGP process make that connection happen? In Ireland, as is in the case across the European Union and across Europe in general, trust and confidence in government and politics is low. While overall economic conditions, high unemployment, and the genuine financial hardships that our citizens and households are facing explain part of that story. There are clearly more fundamental and deep-rooted factors also at play. It's something of an irony that in an era where technological and ICT developments have brought a world of information literally to citizens' fingertips, the distance between government and the governed has never seemed to be as great. I believe that the OGP is a powerful tool to start breaking down that barrier and to reconnect people and, and, and government. As we all know, OGP is a broad and flexible framework that allows each country to determine its own path within the broad parameters set down by the OGP model. The OGP process also fully recognizes that there are no two participating countries that are identical. We each face different challenges, but we can learn much from each other's experience and path. It also places in front of all of us the common goal of open, transparent, and accountable public governance, a goal that is arguably the strongest guarantee of sustainable economic growth political stability, and ultimately the sustainable force for democracy itself. The OGP process obviously throws up significant challenges, both for government and for civil society, particularly at the point that the theory of open government needs to be translated into the concrete reality of a national action plan. This process, rather than ending in disagreement, can often help inspire a dialogue that helps to identify and clarify the competing and sometimes conflicting objectives that underline the different standpoints of both sets of participants. Mutual understanding and respect is therefore a critical factor in the achievement of success. I'm delighted 
that so many of the sessions organized for this meeting are not only led by, but include very substantial practical inputs from civil society. All of those sessions, without exception, while exploring many different and diverse aspects and dimension to the OGP, pose an underlying question for all of us. How can the partnership approach that we've embarked upon between civil society and government at a national level and internationally provide real impetus and concrete momentum to the achievement of our set objectives? The overall theme that we have set for this meeting, <clears throat> open government as a cornerstone of good governance at local, national and European level, that seeks to encapsulate our level of ambition for open government generally, and indeed our ambition for this regional meeting. It also tries to capture the convergence that I believe is urgently needed at local and national government level, and also in our international institutions towards open government principles and practices. This convergence must also move beyond government and civil society to encompass other key stakeholders uh, in society, such as the business community, the trade unions, and the voluntary and community sectors, and of course the media. Several sessions on OGP in action learning from others will take place over the next two days. They are the centerpiece of our meeting. They provide a dynamic and interactive forum for government representatives and civil society organizations to share their perspectives, to share their ideas and experiences on how OGP can become more impactful at national level. These peer learning sessions in which Ireland is participating later today will also mark the formal launch of Ireland's draft national action plan for a further round of public consultation. As I am sure is the case in all countries represented in this room, the preparation of action plans is a process through which a balance needs to be struck. This balance centres on the objectives and priorities of both government and the citizen and civil society participants. That balance is essential in the interests of agreeing what is intended to be an ambitious but practical and realistic set of measures. I look forward to learning from others who have already travelled this path or who are well advanced uh, in the direction of having uh, a robust plan on how the process of developing national action plans can best strike that balance. Our agenda contains a number of sessions relating to the whole area of open data, the potential economic impact, its role in fostering innovation, in boosting transparency, and also in strengthening accountability through the publication of performance information. There is also a broader set of very significant issues to be in, in, uh, engaged with relating to open corporate practices and more effective corporate accountability, in particular in the context of the digital economy. Strengthening the voice of citizens and civil society is a prerequisite for the sustainability of this process. This is an area which I hope that the meeting will provide all of us with wise advice, good guidance for the future, drawn from successful and not so successful lessons that many of you have traveled and learned, both in terms of the OGP itself and outside of it. In terms of Ireland's experience, we have the recent and very positive experience of the Constitutional Convention, of which you're going to hear some more from Tom, as well as considerably less successful models during the boom years that preceded our economic collapse. A key feature of the programme also relates to consideration of the role which international institutions, particularly in Europe, for example the European Union itself, the Council of Europe and the OECD can play, as well as the EU Presidency in advancing open government objectives. So in conclusion, Chairman, I very much look forward to hearing each of you speak the specific reasons why open government objectives have won the commitments of each of your governments and excite the enthusiasm 
of civil society organisations and people across Europe and indeed across the world. I hope that all of our participants at this meeting deepen our understanding and confidence in this process and that it helps us to de deliver a shared analysis of what our objectives and our priorities should be, both at national and at international level, in ensuring ultimately that public confidence uh, in governance, in an open, responsible, accountable governance is developed and maintained. So our work, Chairman, begins this morning uh, and I welcome all of you. I hope you have not only a very fruitful time in Dublin, but also a very enjoyable time here. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank, thank you, Minister. We now have six contributions from our six speakers. And again, could I ask you if you are making a comment or um, asking a question from the floor, do give us your name and, and title. Uh, our first speaker is Tom Arnold, who was appointed Director General of the IIEA in November uh, last, based in Dublin. He was also the Chairman of the Innovative Convention on the Irish Constitution, which sat from uh, 2012 to 2014. Um, he had been previously Assistant Secretary General and Chief Economist in the Department of Agriculture and Food in Ireland, and for a decade or more, he was CEO of Concern Worldwide, Ireland's leading humanitarian organization. Would you welcome Dr. Tom Arnold? Thank you very much, John. Um, as the Minister says, I want to speak about our experience of the Irish Constitutional Convention. And for those of you not from Ireland, the Irish Constitution, uh, current one, dates from 1937. There was a previous uh, constitution drawn up by the first free state government from 1922, but that was changed and put to the people uh, in a referendum in 1937. So that's the constitution we have worked with uh, ever since. The important provision in that constitution was that if it were to be changed, any article, it could only be changed by referendum. And we have had over the decades a series of referendums to bring change to the constitution, but we've never had, if you like, a comprehensive uh, review and systematic review of the constitution. There was, in the run-up to the 2011 election, a general feeling among all the pol political parties that constitutional reform had to be on the agenda. And arising from that, uh, from that uh, election, the Programme for Government in March of 2011 had a commitment to establish a convention on the Irish Constitution at which it this convention would be required to look at a number of articles in the Constitution. So I'm going to tell the story of this Constitution under three broad headings. Firstly, the structure in terms of reference. Secondly, how it operated. Thirdly, what the outcome was, and then I want to draw some conclusions which I think are relevant to any discussion on open government. I have a short paper which will be available to people uh, later in the meeting. So in terms of structure, the convention consisted of 100 members, 66 citizens, 33 politicians, and an independent chairman, myself. The 66 citizens were chosen on the basis drawn by a polling company to be representative of the population in terms of gender, age, socio-economic status and location. The 33 politicians were nominated by the main political parties in the parliament and the independent members uh, in proportion to their strengths, to their parliamentary strengths. The political parties in Northern Ireland were invited to uh, participate and four of them did participate. So four parties were represented from Northern Ireland. So the total composition of the 33 were 29 from the Republic and four from Northern Ireland. The terms of reference, uh, which was drawn up by the government following consultation with the opposition, uh, asked us to consider eight topics. And it said uh, when, and this was agreed by a, a parliamentary resolution, and it also provided that when we dealt with those eight topics, we could consider such other constitutional amendments that may be recommended by the Convention. So the eight topics, very briefly, and there's a little bit more detail about them uh, in the paper, was should the, re should the presidential term be reduced from seven years to five years? 
Should the voting age be, be reduced from 18 to 17 years? Should there be an amendment to the clause on the role of women in the home, uh, which was in the 1937 constitution? Some th a discussion on the increasing the participation of women in politics, provision of same-sex marriage, a review of the Dáil, the parliamentary electoral system, giving the right to vote in presidential elections for citizens living outside the state, and removal of the off offence of blasphemy from the Constitution. So that was the basic terms of reference we were asked to deal with. We were given 12 months to complete our work. Uh, there was an important commitment in the terms of reference uh, passed by the Parliament to say that the government would consider each report of the Convention within four months of receiving the report and if it was to move and accept a recommendation, it would set a time frame for a subsequent referendum to follow. In terms of the operation of the convention, we had a ceremonial opening on the 1st of December 2012 and our first working session the end of January 2013. At this first meeting, I proposed we should operate to the following five principles. Openness, fairness, equality of voice, efficiency, and collegiality. I want to briefly talk about each of these. Openness. We said from the beginning that all of the Convention's work should be open and transparent. All submissions to the Convention would be published on the website, www.constitution.ie, and all the plenary sessions of the Convention would be live-streamed. Second one, fairness. We knew that we were going to be dealing with a number of quite sensitive issues, such as, for example, same-sex marriage. And so it was crucially important that all voices to that debate should be heard fairly and respectfully. And we tried very hard to ensure that that happened. Equality of voice. There was a concern that perhaps politicians with their greater experience in public affairs and public speaking would dominate proceedings. So for an important principle from the beginning was that each member of the convention, citizen or politician, would have an equality of voice. Efficiency. We were going to have to deal with complex issues in a very short time. We, we had meetings at weekends. We had a Saturday and a Sunday morning. So we were obliged to organize our work in an efficient way to get our work done. And very important, collegiality. Collegiality, the notion that if we were to work to best effect, the Convention would need to operate on a, on a basis of shared common purpose in a collegial way. This might seem some kind of frivolous add-on. It's not. It's central, I think, to in the way any group works. And providing the social spaces for people to interact in uh, something like this was terribly important. Each weekend session consisted of three parts. <clears throat> we had presentations by experts who had written and circulated short briefing papers in advance, uh, presentations by advocacy groups to give the different viewpoints about the particular topics we were dealing with, and then very importantly, roundtable discussions of the convention members. And these roundtable discussions were facilitated by trained facilitators and note takers, and they were in a very important part of the process. Taking account of those discussions that took place on a Saturday, we then, over Saturday night, Sunday morning, drew up a ballot paper. And it was, that ballot paper had to be agreed by the Convention, and then it was, that was the ballot paper that was voted upon. And they were, that gave us the formal results of the, uh, of the Convention. But very importantly, the reports that we wrote afterwards reflected the discussion and the debate, so that it, minority viewpoints, when they were expressed, were equally expressed in the reports of the Convention. In terms of the outcome, we dealt with the eight issues that we were asked to deal with during seven plenary meetings from January to November of 2013. And then the any other amendments provision was something that had generated a great deal of interest. There were a lot of individuals and interest groups made submissions to the agenda, to, to the Convention, saying they wished the Convention to deal with additional issues to the eight. And so in order to cope with that demand, 
we had eight, nine regional meetings around the country which generated a great deal of interest and people came and inputted into that. And having taken account of the submissions and the nine regional meetings, the convention then voted on which additional issues we should deal with. We had a limited amount of time to deal with that. We had an additional two months. We decided to deal with two additional topics in the extra two months, and the topics we chose to deal with were Dáil, parliamentary reform, and secondly, the possible inclusion of economic, social, and cultural rights into the, into the, into the Constitution. The work of the Convention was captured in nine reports, and this is all on the Commission website. Everything is, is available. The first eight reports dealt with the original eight issues, plus the two additional issues, and then the ninth report listed the issues that had been requested to be dealt with, but which we didn't have time to deal with, uh, but we put it there as a possible agenda should the Government decide to have a, a, subsequent, uh, a subsequent Convention. And it also provided a summary of our work and reflections on the operation of the convention. So that's the, and so the, the ten issues, ultimately the eight plus the two, re resulted in 38 recommendations for reform, 18 of which would require changes in the constitution. So that formidable agenda of change. So what are the conclusions? In reading for this meeting, I, saw, I was reading about open government partnership and one of the principles, core principles, citizen participation, defined as follows. Governments seek to mobilize citizens to engage in public debate, provide input, and make contributions that lead to more responsive, innovative, and effective government. I think the Convention on the Irish Constitution was very much in line with this core principle. It was innovative to a significant degree, particularly the notion that this model of citizens and politicians would be asked to consider something as important, as fundamental as a constitution and make recommendations on it. There was some criticism that if we were making recommendations, we weren't making prescriptions or we weren't, we weren't making uh, things that were definitely going to be uh, accepted. It was up to the government, having debated in Parliament, to accept or not accept. I think that was the right balance because, you know, we had a, a group, 100 people, not expert, limited time, making broad recommendations. Ultimately, these need to be teased out, understood the implications of, and then I think it's proper that the government makes a decision. The model of having a convention involving citizens and politicians, I think, worked. We had a number of examples in the rest, other parts of the world where purely citizen assemblies have operated. And part of the advantage of this model is I think it brings a level of buy-in on behalf of the political class to the process and to the outcome. And I think we've seen this reflected in the parliamentary debates on our reports uh, that have since ensued. The terms of reference had this important proviso that the government committed to examining the outcome of our recommendations and the reports within four months of the reports being completed and to making public decisions on those. I think the operational principles we operated up are to, openness, fairness, equality of voice, efficiency, and collegiality were really important. I'm not saying they're a prescription for any other country, but I think any process that is beginning to, 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 to be considered in another country perhaps should take these into account as they frame their own way of doing things. And then finally, I think it was a real education in terms of the degree to which the members of the Convention took their responsibilities so seriously as citizens. Because many of these people, many of particularly the citizen members, did not have a background in public affairs. And yet, as we went through our work, as we engaged issue by issue, they became deeply committed to this process and found the whole uh, experience of immense, immensely rewarding. And so I think uh, against the, uh, perhaps the, to the surprise of many of the skeptics uh, that did, greeted our, our commencement of work, we ended up having, I think, a successful convention and one which I think merits, uh, uh, merits interest and in examination by a body such as yourself. Thank you very much indeed.
We have questions um, for Tom just immediately on that agenda. Are you saying the model, um, we, we, big decisions, Tom, are made by, sometimes by as people as few as 12, a jury, um, but we generally think of a public opinion as you know, a sample of a thousand or even more. 66 seems a relatively sm statistically small number. Um, are you confident that as, a, as an instrument that's uh, useful to other societies? Well, I think... It, a polling company which chose them by gender, by uh, age... Gender, age, social, socioeconomic yeah. status and, yeah. and location. And my sense from dealing with uh, these people over a, over a year was that they broadly got it right in terms of that representativeness. And after that, it is the, uh, I suppose it is the principle of the jury. You are ultimately uh, putting, depending on or hoping that a jury of common men and women will arrive at sensible conclusions. And I think, broadly speaking, we, t we so did. Um, you know, I, I would obviously put in the proviso that there were clearly different levels of understanding, different level of knowledge that people came to these topics with. But we worked very hard to provide quality information beforehand, which people read, and then we had a process whereby we had an academic team and experts on the, during the weekend to which people could refer, particularly during the roundtable discussions. And after that, you know, we were making, uh, over, the, over the weekend, people were, I would say, cha many people would have come to some of these meetings thinking they were going to vote in a particular way, and at the end of the weekend, perhaps they changed, had changed their mind. They, they so said this. So I, I think, broadly speaking, it's, it's right. There is a, uh, actually a person who attended, who with his hand up down there, Donald O'Brillicon, I don't want to yeah. preempt your, your yes, chairmanship, but course. Donald was a, not a member, but he was an attender and a contributor and a, a, a submission maker, shall I say. Yeah. Donald, yeah. Um, as Tom said, I made submissions to the convention and then I discovered, quite by accident I've got to admit, that it was possible to attend as an observer but not uh, engage with the participants and I took advantage of that on two topics that interested me. My question, and you've partially averted to it, which you hadn't done in, in your, in your uh, presentation, is the influence of the Academic and uh, Research Advisory Committee. To what extent were they very influential in the, I use the word, the options being presented to the citizens and the politicians, to the convention, and um, how, how they were discussed? So it's a question of yeah. the options that were presented um, would have been formulated, I assume, with the assistance of the Research and Academic Advisory Committee and the extent to which they were influential. Well, obviously, the basic proposition that we were asked to, to deal with were the, were the agendas as defined by government. So the, the basic questions were we had, to, uh, we had to respect the terms of reference we had been given by a resolution of the parliament. But then uh, it's in my paper to say that one of the important background support measures to, to, for the operation of it was an academic and legal team that we had. They were doing this on a voluntary basis um, and they advised us in terms of the selection of the experts for each individual topic because clearly uh, you know, we had different experts for, for different topics. So it, we, we would have had extensive discussions with them to select the, the correct experts. They had a role in briefing those experts in advance because we wanted to make it very clear that we wanted, you know, expert papers written by the best experts there were, but written in language that was accessible to the people that was going to read them. And we were equally requiring that same level of clarity and brevity when those experts came to perform uh, at the convention. So they were, I would say, they were an important part, a very important part. They didn't play any major role in, if you like, influencing uh, outcomes or anything like that. Where they did play an important role was when we were looking at over taking account of what we had discussed on the Saturday and we had to frame a ballot paper 
by Sunday morning, they were very helpful there as well because there we went through, we would have in each case gone through a number of drafts before we came up with a ballot paper which was then presented to the convention. The convention had to discuss it. That was perhaps some of the most difficult jobs I had as chair was to securing agreement on what the convention was going to work, uh, vote on later on the Sunday morning. So I would absolutely pay due tribute to the quality of the academic and legal team that we had. Right, Tom, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our, second, uh, our second speaker is uh, Thea Sulukiani, Minister of Justice uh, in Georgia. Uh, since October 2012. She has 10 years' experience as a lawyer at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and as Minister of Justice uh, is championing reforms in the area of the rule of law and independence of judiciary, open government and anti-corruption. Distinguished delegates, dear Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, dear colleagues, I'm deeply honoured to be here today with you at this important plenary of the Europe uh, regional meeting. My special thanks go to the Government of Ireland and the team who made this possible. I would like also to applaud uh, the work of the OGP support unit and the OGP working groups to facilitate important processes worldwide. Since its inception, um, Open Government Partnership has been laying important foundations of modern governance and this work is mainly between, thanks to cooperation between the government and the civil society partners. This partnership is crucial. Indeed, transparency and openness, accountability, and empowered citizens are key factors in moving democratics, democracies further. And our modern societies know well that these values are critical for economic development of our countries and our society's prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, we gathered here today at the Dublin Castle Conference Center to reaffirm commitment towards our common goal, to support more open and transparent governments across the world. Georgia was amongst the first countries to adhere to the principles of the OGP by joining this initiative in 2011. Three years since then, we can clearly see the value this partnership is bringing to the transparency and accountability agenda of the Georgian government and to the work we are doing at the national level to the benefit of our citizens. To do this, we use in Georgia mainly two tools, advanced technologies and innovative and modern approaches to governance. Georgia aims at building integrity and public trust, increasing transparency, efficiency, and effectiveness of governance, making our government more accessible and accountable to our citizens. Having left its dark Soviet past behind, Georgia now takes pride of being one of the least corrupt countries in Europe where the experience of corruption according to the Global Corruption Barometer Survey in 2013 is 4%. And the World Bank doing business survey places the country at number eight in its rating for reasons of doing business. Our country prides itself with most innovative solutions to public procurement, public financial disclosure, and public service delivery that have attracted huge international interest and especially public service delivery activities in Georgia have been praised by different EU United Nations awards. We are the country where the crime rate is very low and Tbilisi is one of the safest capitals in Europe. Membership to the Open Government Partnership consolidates Georgia's commitments to democratic and open governance and brings the internal modus operandi to the international plane in the spotlight of the international community. Unprecedented level of openness and civil society participation has been achieved by Georgia's government as part of the 2012-2013 action plan commitments. 
Nearly every legislative or policy initiative of our government now undergoes broad, thorough, inclusive and meaningful public consultations. And our government, which has been in power since 2012, now has pledged to increase accountability to citizens and regularly inform the people about their work. For that, monthly press conferences under the Open Government Partnership umbrella are held by ministers individually and personally. We are 19 ministers in the government of Georgia and we report monthly about the achievements and challenges in our <coughs> respective fields. One of the ambitious changes took place also in freedom of information area. We are now working on the Freedom of Information Act and by establishing the obligation of state agencies to proactively publish public information, we adopted a list of information subject to proactive publication and we brought the standards of freedom of information thus to a higher level. This is indeed an example of strong and efficient collaboration between the civil society and government to achieve desired results of transparency and accountability. Georgia's achievements in this regard were highlighted during the OGP London Summit last year, and Georgia was among the seven finalist bright spots showing how open and accountable government is changing people's lives. Now, our second national action plan. We are now developing it already, and <clears throat> it goes through consultative process led by the Open Government Georgia's Forum, which is regular coordination mechanism of Open Government Georgia on the national level, as foreseen by Articles of Governance of the Open Government Partnership. This first draft of our action plan of 2014-2015, presented to the OGP Secretariat several days ago, entrenched the transparency and accountability agenda of the government of Georgia and is a product of, first, regular and intense cooperation of government and civil society in the framework of the Open Government Georgia's Forum, and second, public consultations conducted jointly by representatives of government and civil society throughout Georgia. As a result of this very important process, today the government of Georgia and civil society co-create the National Action Plan of Georgia for the next two years, and we are using mentioned formats to have open dialogue with the civil society and the general public of Georgia to bring new ideas forward for the action plan. Citizens of Georgia have been actively involved in the action plan elaboration process. We selected speakers of the forum and they conducted 19 meetings in 14 cities throughout Georgia in the framework of the OGG, Open Government Georgia. These public consultations were very useful. The target groups included the representatives of local governments, local media, non-governmental organizations on the central but also local level political parties, libertarian students and members of academia. The process engaged more than 700 people who participated in those meetings. In addition to the public consultations, we put online consultation module in place and we created under the OGG banner located uh, on the web page of the Ministry of Justice of Georgia where Citizens <coughs> have an opportunity to write directly to the Secretariat of the OGG about their opinions, ideas. The government can become more open, transparent and accountable. Increasing openness and accountability of public administration by developing separate Act of Freedom of Information Act. Encouraging greater civil society involvement through Open Government Georgia's Forum and promoting public engagement, further increasing the standards of service delivery through inclusion of private sector and municipal services 
first of all, into our e-services portal that Georgian people um, normally call Citizens Portal, and also through uh, Georgia's unique public service halls. Population in Georgia, through those consultation, advised us to increase transparency in the nomination process of our civil servants, and also advised to include private sector and municipal services in our public service halls and in the citizens portal. We're also working on creating open data portal for Georgia, and these are among only few new commitments that are currently included in the draft of our second action plan to meet the demand of citizens. As a conclusion, I can underline once again that Georgia is deeply committed to the common goal of truly open, participatory, collaborative and accountable government and highly values uh, its participation in OGP. We reaffirm, and that's why uh, I'm here today with you, our strong will to continue to be active partner in the OGP and contribute to these unique processes of experience sharing, healthy and engaging competition of the governments to open up, empower citizens and advance the values of modern democratic government. We are indeed committed and we stand ready to support the work of OGP. Thank you. Questions from the floor. <clears throat> can, I, can I ask you what, who, who was resistant to this agenda, and how did you cope with, with them? And who, kind of who were they? Were they? Was this generational to some extent? Um, thank you. This is a very good question. Um, there is a government's will, and when you have a political will of a government, um, which is. Um, quite new, but not that new, because we were elected uh, uh, in 2012. The political will, when it's strong, it helps a lot. And it helps also to uh, fight um, resistance. But resistance sometimes are shown, as we saw it uh, through consultation process, and uh, we saw also it uh, during our sittings, um, at the anti-corruption interagency meetings um, from mainly two groups. Uh, they are in minority, hopefully, but still there is a small degree of resistance. First of all, these can be um, some groups for, from older generations, not because they are resistant as such, but because um, the government puts an emphasis on new technologies when we open up. And um, some members of those groups uh, are missing that needed knowledge. So they can get frustrated sometimes, but we offer them to, uh, to ease uh, the process of being involved in that process. So we can call that resistance, but it's mainly linked to a lack of um, knowledge of new technologies. Second of all, uh, sometimes in elaboration process of our um, new action plan, we see that um, some members of law enforcement agencies can show some in resistance because uh, which is at the same time natural because mainly they are in charge of state security issues and you know that Georgia's territory, nearly 20% of it is, remains occupied by Russian army uh, and in that of course the, uh, those agencies uh, who are in charge of state security, national integrity, territorial integrity can sometimes show resistance. Um, and by resistance, I mean asking more questions than we would like to, to hear. Because when you have um, over and over the same questions, of course, your pace is decreased. And we need to move forward very, very fast in order to meet all the commitments we, uh, we have do, uh, during, um, we, f we have advanced during our different OGP meetings. Okay. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, our next speaker is Salima Abu, Tunisia, uh, founder and president of the association uh, Tuensa in Tunisia, an organization for awareness and vigilance in what is a society in transition. Salima. Thank you, John. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like first to convey on behalf of the Tunisian civil society and Tunisian citizens, my sincere thanks to the government of Ireland to, for hosting us to this event and for their warm welcome. Your Excellency, I believe that friendliness of the, of the blind inhabitants are, has nothing to invite to the Balini inhabitants. I also extend my thanks to Mr. Ben Khalifa the current Tunisian Secretary of State of Go for Governance for his presence among us in this European Region OGP Summit. Before the revolution, Tunisia represented the polar opposite of open governance. Last January, Tunisia joined the OGP. One more time, our, our government has formally expressed his international commitment to be transparent and participative. What does that mean for Tunisian people? We have realized that former regime avoided real international engagement. It excelled in monitoring not its governmental officials, but its citizens. Today, for the majority of Tunisia, of Tunisian, good governance still sounds hollow and hazy word that means nothing. But I would like to reassure you that hundreds of civil society organizations and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of citizens really decide to blaze the path toward transparency and accountability. For me, for TWENSA, the organization I represent, for the Tunisian civil society collective of more than 15 civil organizations working on OGP, for the Open Gov. Uh, movement, the Tunisian Open Gov movement of more than 4,000 citizens advocating for open government and open data, for all CSOs, civil society organizations working in the field of transparency, openness represent the only path that can lead Tunisian people recover their dignity and guarantee to their children rule of law, justice, employment, and real freedom. But we soon realized that things don't change in a magic wand. We realized that, it, that if we would like to maintain the revolutionary spirit, we have to develop revolutionary, revolutionary mechanisms. We realized that if we would like to reach our targets, we have to develop tools and methods. We realized that the mode of governance must evolve to achieve our goals faster. And as the OGP Super Tunit is always advising us to be supportive and annoying, today I would like to ask everyone here to support us to be supportive and to support us to be annoying. As soon as things started in Tunisia, 13 actors from the Tunisian civil society specialized on the issues of transparency and good governance officially announced the beginning of their participation in the OGP process. This open collective include, among others, TWENSA, OGP, uh, Open GovTN movement, Labo Democratique, Article 19, ATCP, ATUJ, and we focused on the process and pointed the necessity to have an inclusive process. Active association and isolated citizen from different regions of the country must be involved. Here, we need your support, OGP, support and gov Tunisian government to found every concrete actor. The Open 10 OGP Collective can be the instrument for that. We pointed out the necessity to have a constructive process. The 10 OGP Collective put forward the idea of an online, an online platform that can provide a common document common documentation database together with a collaborative tool to assist in the drafting of the action plan. 
Here also we need your support to register and participate to our platform. Thus, we can establish a constructive dialogue and profit from the experience of each other. We also pointed out the necessity that the process have to be transparent and realistic. We propose to Mr. Ben Khalifa to explicit the role of each stakeholders and to adapt, to adapt the methodology that citizen civil society have already agreed about. We recommend an autonomous and sustainable process that <coughs> can take into account, as our constitution said, the national level as well as the regional and the local level. Recently, two days ago, our government has launched the public consultation with the objective to have an action plan of, on September. They asked civil society to define three members that would join the government and civil society uh, committee. Besides the civil society working on a concrete methodology and defining, is also working on defining roles and precising calendar. And within a week, we will propose that draft and select the three members that will be involved in the process. At this very moment of our history, Tunisian civil society are facing a crit critical juncture. We are about to organize an OGP dedicated seminar in the following month. Everyone will be more than welcome to help us in collaboration of our government to challenge the Tunisian process and to identify our priorities. And also to define the main topics and commitments that should be addressed. This local seminar could be a very critical moment for the success of OGP process in Tunisia. So our message is simple, support us to be support, supportive and support us to be annoying. Many thanks. And from, from your experience, um, how do you recruit the some of the old guard, the middle, the middle managers of any of the administration to this agenda? From the beginning, we, from the beginning of the revolution, we worked with a dialogue with the administration. We, we've made lots of, of seminar in order to know each other because before the revolution it was two separate uh, uh, words. So uh, from the beginning, we've made a national meeting of civil society and we invited uh, the National Assembly and we invited all the government that were at that time involved. And we're trying not even to, to, to be at the high levels, but to know who are the main actor and how can we work and build things together. And it's, we are about three years working on that and confidence are, is built, we, we are noticing that they're, they're good people, they're, they, we can find people that we can work with, and they're also surprised because it's new for them. So they're um, beginning to, to, to know who is working for Tunisia and who is not, and who is patient with them, and who is really willing to, advance, to, to go further, so it's a good... Uh... I know there are a lot of questions in the room, so we'll take them off the panel later. Thank you very much. <laughs> our, our, fourth, our fourth speaker, before we open it to the, the floor, is Emily O'Reilly, who was elected a European Ombudsman in 2013. She's an author and former journalist and broadcaster who became Ireland's first female ombudsman in 2003. And from 2007, she was also appointed commissioner for environmental information. Uh, she's a former political editor, broadcaster, and author, Emily O'Reilly. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, John, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation here this morning. Uh, and I'd like to congratulate Minister Howland and his department on this very tangible demonstration of their commitment to the OGP uh, project. It's a particular privilege to be here as European Ombudsman uh, after my time as Irish Ombudsman and Information Commissioner. 
and to join with my successor, Peter Tyndall, among others, in discussing what I consider potentially to be a transformative initiative of unprecedented scale and significance. If it is revolutionary, and I believe it can be, the revolution comes essentially from the jettisoning of the idea that government is the sole preserve of government. The guiding philosophy of OGP, as I understand it, is that by giving to citizens what was previously locked away in the private files of the administration, that they can join as partners with government to propose and to create themselves new ways of producing and delivering public services that can radically improve the lives of people from the richest to the poorest states of our world. At its most radical, it partly decouples the legislative process from the legislators and allows the collective wisdom of the people, aided by the supply of critical data collected by government and public agencies, to make better laws and better regulations and propose more intelligent and effective ways of running our countries. Another critical focus of the OGP is its anti-corruption drive. The estimated cost of global bribery is more than $1 trillion per annum. In the EU member states, a conservative estimate is over €120 billion Euro per annum, roughly the size of the entire EU budget. The cost to human welfare, to human health, to the life prospects of the poorest of our children, to the environment, and to third world development in particular, perhaps, is incalculable. As European Ombudsman, I particularly appreciate the invitation because the EU does not, as such, participate in the OGP. I'll say more about that, what I think could and should be done about that, in a panel session this afternoon. But given the increased and increasing role of the EU institutions in the lives of the people of the individual member states of the Union, I believe that it should be possible to find a way for key EU institutions, and including my own, to play their role in the development of this initiative, which resonates so much with their own work and with their drive to develop and promote better standards of transparency, accountability and integrity. Two days ago in Frankfurt, for example, I met with the President of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, and discussed, given both the drive towards a banking union and closer and more direct ECB supervision of member state banks within the Eurozone, how important it will increasingly become for the ECB to become more transparent and to allow citizens much more access to information to the decision-making process of the bank. The European Commission just yesterday responded to questions I posed arising out of an inspection by my office of files relating to how it deals with conflict of interest situations involving civil servants moving into the private sector. Late last year, following another investigation, the Chairman of the Commission's Ad Hoc Ethical Committee stepped down in light of concerns raised about possible conflicts with his own work in the private sector. The institutions, and particularly the Commission, are working to improve their governance standards and transparency standards, and I believe that if a way is found to bring those institutions into this initiative, then those efforts will be enhanced. The institutions are now too vital to the lives of EU citizens to be mere onlookers at something that is now gaining such global traction. But this morning I want to focus on why I see the OGP as a uniquely transformative development. The OGP creates positive synergies among agendas that used to be largely separate and among associated policy communities that used to pursue those agendas largely in isolation from one another. They are the FOI agenda, the public participation agenda, the quality of governance agenda, the e-governance uh, government agenda, and the open data agenda. The FOI agenda, as we know, is focused mainly on access to information as a way of making the holders of public power accountable to citizens for their decisions. Public participation is focused on empowering citizens and civil society. Although participation is sometimes presented as an input value in terms of adding legitimacy, it also has an output dimension. 
The idea behind, for example, the Aarhus Convention is that public participation has the potential to change the outcomes of public decision-making on the environment and change them for the better. Good governance is perhaps the broadest agenda. At one end of its range, it comes close to the accountability focus of FOI, bringing together concern for ethical issues, conflicts of interest and lobbying. At the other end, it comes close to better or smart regulation, and so shades into the output focus of public participation. The e-government agenda concerns improving citizens' access to public services and making those services more efficient. Open data is perhaps the outrider. Its primary focus is access to data as a commercial resource. But there are also synergies with the other agendas, and a key insight of open data advocates is the transformative potential of open data access on public policy, an issue that I'm not yet sure the general public is sufficiently aware of. But the successes that have already emerged from government open data initiative, from water point mapping in Tanzania to help rural communities access water supplies, to cancer outcome mapping in the UK, should convince the sceptics of its worth. The most exciting thing about the OGP, to my mind, is that it creates a process and a forum in which the synergies between these different agendas and policy communities can be explored and developed. The OGP process is itself something new. It is not based on a treaty between states or a formal legal framework. Its legitimacy is based both on inputs and outputs. Indeed, one of the most exciting things about it is that it makes that kind of distinction seem rather old-fashioned. I have no doubt that OGP is the most promising 21st century global development towards making a living reality of open government and good government. That is why, as an Irish citizen, I am delighted and proud that Ireland is participating in the OGP. As European Ombudsman, I will do everything within my power to make sure that the European Union is not left on the sidelines. Thank you for your attention. So, have we questions? Yes. Middle of the row here. Yeah. Shall we direct questions to the entire panel? Well, if you have a question for Emily first, and then I, I, I'll open it to the rest of the panel. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question, Emily. How differ? Uh, I take it you're now wearing. You've had to leave the green jersey at home, have you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. What, is the, what, what are the faults? What's your agenda towards that Ireland? As you're so knowledgeable about the Irish situation, what do we need to do next? Well, when I'm, as we say here, over in Europe, um, I, I have to stop myself saying <laughs> at home uh, because you tend to take what happens here as, as your baseline. Uh, and of course, it, it is in some degree because that is, that is your experience. But I suppose when, when people uh, ask me what, what the main difference is between the work I did here and, and, and the work in Europe, um, I suppose 80% of it is, is sort of the same. There's a complaint, there's an institution, you deal with it and so on. I suppose the, the, the difficult and the challenging piece is that is the multicultural piece. And I don't just mean the language, but I mean the different thought processes that the different member states and indeed the institutions have in relation to issues such as transparency, conflict of interest because you think there is a certain agreed standard and you find out that there isn't. So even though, and I'm conscious that the minister is sitting in the front row there looking at me, um, even though we might think that, that our transparency regime, which is the old regime as opposed to the new regime that will be coming in, uh, it might be sort of uh, uh, not, not of a terribly high standard. In fact, it's actually quite advanced uh, uh, in re as it relates to, to member states, but also as it relates to the regime that operates within uh, a lot of the institutions within Europe itself. Also, issues such as ethics, conflict of interest, I suppose, uh, and whistleblowing, which is a, a fairly current, uh, current issue here now. Um, I suppose part of the reason why, uh, and, and I, I do give credit to the Minister for the reform agenda that, that he and his colleagues are pursuing, I think something that gave a, a sharpness to the, uh, to the, the political um, 
um, uh, need or the, the, the politicians feeling they needed to work on this agenda was because of the crash in the recession and what that threw up. And because um, uh, those sort of uh, impulses or cues are, are slightly more diffuse through in, in Europe. Uh, I don't think there is the same focus. So, you know, there is still um, a huge amount of work that needs to be done within the institutions, and I suppose the Commission is the is the lead institution in relation to the very issues that the OGP agenda is pursuing. And that's why, and I don't know how this could be affected. I, I gather there are people from the Commission who will be speaking later in the day, but, but I think it seems um, it, it, it simply isn't viable um, that an initiative like this could not include the major institutions of the EU, given the impact that they have uh, on our daily lives and indeed on, on the government of the member states. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now take your question. I uh, hope you kept the microphone. Wait, somebody else with the microphone. I'll come to you next. But whoever has the microphone gets in first, yes. Oh, all right, fine. Thanks. I'm Steve Adler from IBM. Uh, Emily, thank you for that great presentation. Really enjoyed that. Uh, E-participation has been tried in Europe for at least a decade, and the public so far has not participated a great deal. When I listen to uh, the presentations this morning, I hear that small numbers of the members of the public are participating in OGP activities, but OGP itself is still relatively unknown in the public at large. Very, very few citizens have ever heard of it. So what are your ideas for increasing public, I don't want to use the word civil society, I find that's a strange word, public participation in government? How will this be institutionalized? How will more members of the public be brought in? How will we increase demand for the public to participate in government. Not through the traditional uh, democratic elected representational processes, but in some of the examples here today, what are your ideas for increasing public participation? Emily first. Um, I know um, within the EU, and certainly now that we have the European parliamentary elections on, you know, there, there is so much talk about the so-called democratic deficit. And obviously, you know, when you're talking to people from the parliament or the commission, they're always, um, you know, scratching their heads and wondering how are we going to get more citizen buy-in and so on. And one of the initiatives that arose out of the Lisbon Treaty was the idea of the, um, the European Citizens Initiative, whereby if you get a, a million citizens from, I think it's either seven or nine different uh, uh, member states, they can propose, for example, to the Commission uh, a particular uh, initiative. And, you know, what happens after that is, is a little fuzzier. The Commission has to... Um, has to uh, uh, think about it, uh, the Commission has to give an opinion on it, but the Commission actually ultimately doesn't have to do anything about it. Uh, so at the moment, as, as European Ombudsman, I'm looking at the way that the ECI is working. I think there are two initiatives have got across the line. In other words, they got a million signatures, they ticked all the boxes. One was in relation to the right to water, which the Commission in a sense sort of kicked to touch. The other was a more con controversial one in relation to um, embryonic stem cell research, which you'd be aware is, is very sensitive. I don't think they've given an opinion on that. Um, they have to do so by the end of May. So I don't think, and there's somebody from the Commission, I, I think, here later who, who might speak about this, I don't think the Commission has fully worked out what to do with this new Hello, person from the Commission. From, 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 with, with, this, with this new toy, I'm not quite sure what, uh, uh, how they are supposed to, they, that they know how they are supposed to deal with it. But the point, and I think this is the point you're making, unless something happens with one of those initiatives, then the citizens will lose interest and they'll think that this was just a bit of, of uh, uh, you know, a, a frippery, that, 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 that just meaningless uh, chatter. Uh, but equally in relation to the initiatives, I mean, when you read any of the stuff about the OPG and you see the actual tangible outcomes that have emerged, I mean, I think that is going to excite citizens. People want to see results. They don't want to hear abstract talks about it and so on, transparency and all that sort of stuff. What they want to see is tangible outcomes. And I think the more that word is spread about what is happening globally in relation to citizen-led initiatives I think that's that's when it's going to gain traction and that's when the political class really will have to take it on board yeah. Thea? Uh, thank you. Um, the OGP is as an initi initiative and as a process uh, 
uh, it can be seen on the example of Georgian government helps us to discipline our ideas and to um, and oblige us to uh, to adopt a certain way of thinking because we should have a national action plan and then we um, travel a lot uh, to see Georgians where they live and ask them what should be included in that action plan. So uh, thus we try to increase society's participation or public participation as you called it. Uh, of course there are two parts, the civil society which is um, always with us uh, because they come and ask for more involvement if someday they think that they are not involved enough. But as far as uh, ordinary citizens are concerned, I think that in Georgia we found a way to go and see them. And it's not about only the election day because uh, we'll be holding election, uh, local government election on the 15th of June this year. But this is not the only way to, to, to understand what's, what's needed in the minds of population. So we go and see them. Uh, and I'll give you another example. For instance, in the Ministry of Justice, we, we um, have lots of services, public services, to be delivered to our people uh, through the public registry, notary chamber, civil registry, etc. And what we imagined is that um, myself, I travel and see uh, the civil servants who work for me and for the Ministry of Justice on the territorial levels. And we hold those, uh, we, I, I personally um, hold those consultations with my own civil servants to understand what people say on the local level when they come and see the civil servants of the Ministry of Justice who work on the local level. Uh, meaning closer to the citizens. And when we gather this information, we can understand that everything is not like we see them from the capital. And then we understand that people come and complain, complain for instance, on different things on the local level we cannot even imagine when sitting in the capital um, office. So. Um, Going to meet the citizens, this is one way of thinking we are trying to put in place in the Ministry of Justice and also through the whole government of Georgia. And the small example I quoted, which is the Prime Minister's initiative and works well also, is about monthly press conferences organized by every minister uh, who should be open to any question any question on the agenda of that ministry? Of that ministry or on the, on the agenda of the government. And then you receive, uh, God knows, tricky questions as well. And you cannot hide yourself from anything. So this was our Prime Minister's idea and I cannot say that every month I'm happy to go there, but I go there and I answer questions. But I'm asking you a question here. Are, are those press conferences by individual ministers, are they obliged to answer on any agenda or just on the agenda for which they hold responsibility? When I came in this room and we had a small discussion, you told me that I was allowed to say I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but at that conf press conference when I do not know anything about, for instance, a question about agriculture, which is not my portfolio, of course I answer I don't know. but. Um, uh, mainly as far as it comes to justice, judiciary, because we are in the Ministry of Justice leading the judiciary reform in Georgia, uh, jails, prisoners' rights, and transparency and accountability, of course the Minister of Justice receives many, many questions. Uh, and we have the banner of open government partnership behind, which helps the society to see that these um, concrete press conference is organized under the umbrella of this initiative. Okay, um, yes, the question here. Thanks, Benjamin Herzberg from the World Bank. I had a question first for uh, uh, Selima Abu. You mentioned the need to open a dialogue process with the civil society and the government in Tunisia, and you did not mention once the role of the private sector. And the private sector is they are creating jobs in Tunisia. I was I was wondering if that's because of the patronage that existed in the previous system, and now, 
if there is kind of a, a fear to engage with the private sector. Similarly, in uh, Georgia, I don't know what the relationship is between the government and the private sector, and if you're building trust, uh, and so maybe uh, Mr. Tsulukani can answer, and, and, and Tom, you did not mention also private sector in the Constitutional Commission, so I don't know what their role is, and I, I just want to point that in this open process of dialogue between the government and the civil society, it's not just civil society like the civil society organizations, it's everybody, and the private sector is a big part of that, so what's your take on it? Yeah. Thank you. Salima. You know that um, the World Bank has made an inquiry on private sector in Tunisia, and you know that it's still the same process and the same clientelism that exists. So uh, we're, we have a private sector in the committee uh, between uh, government and Tunisian civil society, and we are still doubting if it's the f good private sector that will make things change. We would like a real change. I think they have to be there. We are from private sector. But I, I left aside my job and I left aside all my life to, to get involved to this process. So we believe that private sector is not a happy few. Private sector has to, be, has to become from all the civil society. Private sector is in a regional, regional level. Private sector is also in a local level. So private sector is not a hundred of uh, private uh, firms that uh, lead the country, things may have to change. So we expect that private sector, in this case, we were just discuss discussing about that a few minutes ago before the, uh, the conference, how can we make them really change things? Shall, shall we choose the biggest uh, Lutica, the biggest one in Tunisia, or shall we work with the others? How can we change, and from a concrete manner, the dialogue? And that's it's not so obvious. Yeah. Um, in Georgia, the private sector representatives, uh, businessmen, understand that um, the principles of this initiative, when they work and they should work, it's helpful for their own work. Uh, so that the private sector can prosper, the government should be uh, transparent and work well. And they understood that even if we, le we left uh, behind our Soviet past, not um, uh, only 20 years ago. Uh, I just um, give you an example. For instance, we have the huge success in uh, transparency of procurement state procurements thanks to new technologies because every procurement in Georgia goes through um, an electronic system and every, everyone can see everything. This is our principle. And I can assure you that the private sector cherishes a lot this achievement. Uh, also, every single um, revenue declaration, and we widened very recently the number of civil servants who should fill in the forms, is also electronic and completely open to everybody. And the private sector loves it. So um, I mean by to this, giving you these two examples to show you that if we do not uh, push further than that our transparency uh, commitments and implementation of that um, in the anti-corruption council that that's chaired by the Minister of Justice in Georgia we have um, sitting members from big businesses as well and they can be very unhappy and they are allowed to let us know that because they know that the transparent state structures uh, when they are transparent accountable it's very good for their own work so the collaboration is um, is quite fruitful because there is a truly and genuinely a good exchange of information and let's say so pretensions when they are unhappy they let us know and we are obliged to correct things yes yeah uh, Anne Calgan civil society co-chair of the joint working group on the Ni Irish national action plan in his opening remarks, the minister, when he was speaking about uh, citizen engagement, highlighted the importance of informed public debate as the basis of open government. 
And my question to the panel is about that concept of informed and debate. It can happen that public policy proposals that are of deep interest to the public can sometimes be presented in such technical language that it, they become the domain of the expert and the public feel excluded. So I'm wondering, what is the single most important action a government can take to ensure that the public are routinely informed in an accessible way about public policy proposals? And secondly, are there any new structures needed for public debate? Right. Tom, Tom Arnold. Well, I, you know, I think one of the real lessons of the convention was, was that we required all our experts and there were many of them highly expert experts uh, to express themselves in written and in verbal form in languages that in language that was accessible. I think that principle should be extended as a general principle to the way government communicates. I think there are considerable differences across the different departments as to their the accessibility of the of the reports. I mean. The er one area that I, I know well, obviously, is the whole development aid sector. And there, over the past decade, I would say, the quality of presentation, the accessibility of presentation of what they have done is actually a model for, uh, for, for other government departments. So it's, I think, insisting, and the public insisting, that governments operate to that standard of accessibility. Um, so, and that's, you know, that's, I think, a hugely important part of, of generating that informed debate. After that, of course, it's, it's about a process as well. I mean, clearly, if people are being asked to, uh, you know, to contribute to, 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 to a debate, um, the, the process has to be, f f if you like, friendly to that participation. And finding ways of doing that, I think, is, is critical. I don't know what's going to be in the action plan, the open government action plan, but I would imagine that that sort of, uh, both the, the way in which government communicates with citizens and the way in which, uh, in written form and, and other forms, and the way it allows citizens to engage with it should be central to it. Yeah, the, the, the question was asking, had you any advice on what should be in the plan? <coughs> Well, I'd say those two basic things that I've just said, are, are, I would say, are, 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 would be good starting yep. points. Yeah. Emily? Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of things uh, to, uh, to increase public awareness and public participation. I mean, I think obviously the, the proactive disclosure of, of, of records and minutes of meetings and that we know um, what meetings are taking place in, in government and parliament and, and, and so on and, and who the influences are and how we can get involved also in, 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 uh, in, in, um, in developing policy or, or whatever. I think the point you make about the uh, impenetrability of, of language is, is an excellent one uh, because that creates an exclusion zone from people. Uh, and uh, just, just yesterday actually I was, I was reading a uh, a piece about the development of, of legislation and regulation in, in, in the EU and how that has become really uh, impenetrable despite the best efforts of, of people in, like the Commission in relation to, to clear writing and so on. But that really does put a barrier between um, the European citizen and what's going on. And I think very often, and I served on, on many referendum commissions, including ones that, that had European treaties at them, I, I can honestly say I'd say most of the people did not know uh, what, what they were voting on. And sometimes when things happen many years later, and we think, how did, how did that happen? How, did, how, did that, how come that was introduced or that was introduced? And, and the answer is, well, you voted uh, on it. But I, I think um, a lot of those, Charlie McCreevy got you know, hit around the, the, the head for saying that he hadn't read the treaty. But I mean, in some sense, he was right because it was, it was unreadable uh, virtually. And um, I also remember a few years ago on uh, the referendum commission when um, I think you're we held with Brian Cowan, actually. And the point was that he'd written it. He'd, he'd actually, he hadn't read yeah, it. As no, a I think it was Charlie who said he hadn't. Yeah, I think, yeah, maybe the two of them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I remember we, uh, the referendum commission, we had a press conference and uh, we thought we had got to grips with whatever treaty it was. And then uh, from, from, from the bowels of the, of, the, of the conference, a journalist asked us, um, what does comatology mean? Um, and uh, 
uh, not, not, not one of us really had, had, had a clue what, what comatology was. It's one of those almost like invented words w within the EU. And one helpful RTE journalist then <laughs> told us uh, what comatology um, uh, actually meant. So um, if, if at that level you could say a, a, lot, of, a lot of these texts and, uh, are impenetrable, then on the one hand the EU can't produce them and on the other hand sort of whine about the fact that, that the citizens um, uh, don't buy in or, or don't engage with, with, with what they're doing. And I think there's a huge piece of work uh, to be done just in, in, in rendering that language accessible. But sometimes it's a matter of law, isn't it? That, it? that legally it has to be in a certain language to cover all kind of eventualities, and then you need the gist of it in, in, plainer, in plainer law. Uh, yeah, but you rarely get the gist of it in plainer law. That's the piece yeah. that's missing. Yeah. 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 Here, and then, then the minister, yeah. Um, my name is Jonathan Victory. Uh, uh, from the Irish group Second Republic, we'd campaigned for the establishment of constitutional convention, and uh, I got to observe one of the meetings, so I just wanted to return briefly to that because uh, there was a lot of overlap um, between proposals, uh, between recommendations from the Constitutional Convention and a lot of the action plan proposals that were coming out of the OGP here in Ireland. Uh, uh, for example, like lowering the voting age to 16 or introducing citizen initiatives, stuff like that. But um, <coughs> I want to ask about um, just the, the government's response to the recommendations of the convention, because the government actually hasn't responded in the last few months, and I suppose to be fair, there are a lot of recommendations to sort through, and I'm, I'm sure they'll do them in due course, but it's just that there could be like over, well over a dozen proposals that would require constitutional change, so the implication might be over a dozen referendums. So I'm wondering um, when and how the government should respond to them, because there, there was a recent case of Iceland who also had a constitutional convention, and um, they, they produced their recommendations, but a new government was elected and they just decided they weren't interested in pursuing those reforms anymore. So, uh, okay, we have, I suppose we if have Tom or the Minister uh, here could... Put it to Tom, yeah. yeah. Well, very briefly, I mean, the government have responded to three, the first three reports. And I would have to say responded in a considered and very serious way. Uh, they have now... There, there are now some reports where the, that four-month deadline has not... Uh, has slipped. Uh, the Taoiseach said in a recent Dole reply that they were waiting for the final report. That final report is now delivered. So I do. I would have an expectation that the government will now uh, deal with the, remain, with the remaining reports. Uh, I do say in the in the brief paper here that I have that I think that issue of <clears throat> follow through on the basic commitments that the government made is actually very important because I think if it were not to follow through and follow through to referendums in a, in a number of cases, um, then I think it would undermine the credibility of the convention. I don't expect, I have to say, that the government necessarily uh, accepts and swallows whole and entire every single recommendation. That was the point I made, that you know, <clears throat> we, we were asked to provide recommendations. We made general recommendations over a day and a half, after a day and a half's examination, there is certainly a lot more detailed examination of some of those uh, recommendations required in or before they should be put to a refer to referendum. Right. We have the minister here. Yeah. Uh, thanks indeed. I, I just wanted to actually pick up uh, really, I think, the most important uh, issue that has been raised, and that is uh, how to concretize um, public, as was said, as opposed to civil society, involvement in core decision making. Um, and obviously, accessible information is an important prerequisite. But in and of itself, it is not the vehicle for participation. I just want to say three things briefly. Um, when I was Minister for the Environment, one of the initiatives that I piloted, and I have to say wasn't a great success, maybe because I wasn't Minister for Environment long enough, but was the idea of um, policy committees for each area, for housing, for transport and so on, at local level that involved both the elected and the civil society groupings making decisions at policy level uh, locally. That didn't um, develop as it should, but I think it's still a, a vehicle for that. The second model, which I think is really important, that has not yet um, been active enough here, is pre-legislative scrutiny. And that is before we have any legislation that draft proposals go before a committee of parliament and anybody who wants to say something about it makes a submission and anybody who has something important to question 
is invited in a public forum to rigorously question the issues. I think that's a basis for a real advance of participation. Uh, but the last point I want to make, and I'm, I'm interested in people's, um, the panel's uh, view on this. Uh, I, you know, we've come through in Ireland the most difficult economic um, circumstances in our history in the last three or four years. Not only an economic collapse, but a, a, a collapse in confidence in governance and the capacity of oversight that we're now rebuilding. But part of the problem now is the lack of contextualizing any issue. Every issue is seen in isolation. So on the same uh, platform, you can have lobbyists for less taxes, but more public expenditure. For more public expenditure in every issue, nothing is contextualized in the round. Uh, so how do we have a debate, and it's, it's probably a question for the media more than anybody else, that issues are contextualized so that we can set priorities that are actually doable as opposed to everybody being on the side of uh, you know, what is simply popular. Yeah. Salima? Um, in Tunisia, it's a completely different uh, way of uh, thinking because we, there were about more than 15,000 civil society eager to participate and we are just trying to have the tools. But in your, uh, your countries, northern countries, you have movements. You have the Occupy uh, everything. So <laughs> you have to get them involved and you have to get them think the process all together. I believe that particip participation must be from the ground, from the ground level. And we have to moderate each movement. We have to create sort of how can you, the feedback can be up and how can we moderate the downs, the, down, the down level, the local level. Perhaps with our tools we can help you later. I don't know. We'll define. We are in a also new century with e-learning, with e, e everything also. So perhaps we will define some tools that we can help more participation in the north. I don't know. Tom, well, this last question I think is a hugely difficult one. I, I don't have any major answers or insights. Um, I mean, I think government still has to try and provide that context and, and set it out and, and, and just explain that, you know, everything can't be done. But, you, you're, you know, we, we are always going to have interest groups and, and so on, and, and they're going to be looking at it through their perspective. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm afraid, unpopular as it is, it's going to be governments that's going to have to make those, make those decisions. But I think some of the processes you're talking about earlier are really important. I mean, one was struck earlier this year when what was undoubtedly going to be a hugely difficult political issue, the, the, uh, the abortion issue, was dealt with in, a, in the Health Committee in a way which engaged people. Uh, and f everyone, I think, went away from that feeling that their voices had been heard. And those voices having been heard, then it did come back to government to make the call as to what was politically feasible. Mm -hmm. And that broad principle, I think, may well be a, have application elsewhere. Yeah. Yes. Good morning. My name is Mechtel Rohn. I'm from the European Commission in Brussels. And I wanted to come in a couple of times already, did not manage so far. But uh, I would like to make a couple of, of, of comments on what Emily said, what came out from the audience and where we are with e-participation e e and so on. What I'm working on is ICT-enabled public sector innovation through open government. And there we are. We do not, let me say, further develop the theories of open government, but we look for concrete steps, how to implement and how to implement elements. And there we do not start from, from scratch or from zero. Uh, it may not be known, but for the reason I'm trying to, to convey the message here a bit, in e-participation we have been working in the ICT-related directors general, where I am coming from and not from, the, from those who work on the policies, uh, 
we have had series of e-participation projects in order to try out and experiment and do pilots to involve citizens in decision making of public administrations, to involve citizens in legislation making, in the, to, in, to, to allow citizens to interact with the European Parliament, to interact with their local parliament, and all of this supported by ICT. Um, I'm this afternoon in this parallel session with Emily where I can explore a bit more on that. We have now developed, coming from that angle, developed a vision for public services through, let me say, innovation through open government. And there I can, I can say we, have, we are already in several framework programs for research and innovation in other funding programs where we spend money in order to allow organizations, private organizations in cooperation with the public sector to do pilots and to implement indeed interaction between citizens and politicians and administrations and so on. So um, I'm very happy to be here today that I at least can get this message across because it is, it is not very well known that these possibilities exist and I would like to invite all of you to come to that session this afternoon. But the question I have to the panel, coming from this angle from ICT enabling public sector modernization, to which extent do you believe can existing ICT indeed help you in your aims to implement open government on all the different aspects, being it open data, open processes, uh, being it transparency, being it collaboration, being it production of services in cooperation between the public sector and the private sector, between citizen and an administration, to which extent do you believe ICT can help you, does help you, or to which extent probably ICT still needs to be further developed for certain aspects of this? Okay. Um, yes, Thea. Yeah. Um, we have in Georgia, the, as in every country with different names, the um, official journal of Georgia on which um, every law needs to be published in order to be entered into force. And um, what we imagined is that we uh, publish draft laws um, well before they are presented uh, before Parliament on, that, on the same web page and we allow citizens to comment it. Uh, of course, uh, it's possible because um, new technologies exist, thanks to them, but what should be mentioned um, uh, to answer your question, ICT, of course, is the easiest and uh, thus the best way to make any government more transparent, but in Georgia we experience problems to have full coverage of the country when it comes to internet, for instance. So uh, parallelly, the private sector world works on covering Georgia so that in rural areas people can consult web pages. And when it's fully covered, then of course the ICT and all those technology um, mechanisms are the easiest and that's why the best way to open up every, every governmental uh, initiative to the population. Okay. Tom? Well, just I suppose our experience in the convention was that we used ICT to the maximum possible um, in terms of social media, in terms of live streaming, in terms of a, a very active website. And we think that was an important part of why the, the, the convention got the degree of public engagement that it did. So, I mean, I don't have any, I think at, at the broad principle then, it's about understanding for, any, for whatever initiative you're, you're implementing, understanding the new potential that ICT has and finding smart ways to use it and integrate it into how you're doing your business. Yeah. Salima? In the same manner, um, from the revolution, we get all involved in uh, Facebook and we get YouTube and everything goes open. So uh, Tunisians are high level, the level is high educated people. So I think they will get into it, but they have to build the tools and the right tools and identify the, e -particip the good e-participation, which is the good one and which is not. So I think the process is going on and it rapidly with Emily? Yeah, obviously, I mean, I think I was talking about the ECI initiative and, and without a good ICT, it would be very difficult for people um, to organize a million plus uh, signatures and, and get them in on time. But I think one of the things we have to say here is that 
you know, whatever has prompted this um, uh, open government uh, or partnership and all of that. I mean, ICT, information technology, has really been the enabler of all of this. I mean, that is the thing that has brought the genie out of the bottle. Whether governments like it or not, people are participating because they can. And they can infiltrate and get involved in a way that was unimaginable, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, let alone 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and I think what, what governments are having to do, and I, I mean, I, I do see a great enthusiasm for joining uh, with this, this particular OPG initiative, is that they, they have to, in a way, the ICT is ahead of the political curve, and the political curve is, 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 having, to, is having to catch up. One of the odd things, though, about since we're on to openness and transparency about the new media is the number of particularly younger people who are so enthusiastic about it, but who seem singularly reluctant, I'm old-fashioned in these matters, to sign their names to these opinions that they hold. So I, 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 have a re I don't read stuff if there's no signature on it. That's just me. I have a final question here. I'm a f we're running out of time because of the clock, but this um, will be our last speaker. Yeah. My name is Fred Logue. I'm a lawyer based in Ireland. And it was very welcome to hear the government's commitment to the Open Government Programme uh, in light of it being a key instrument for the combating of corruption the increasing uh, increase of public participation decision making and uh, generally strengthening the, weak, the, the link between citizens and government. It was equally uh, welcome to hear that Ireland's attitude towards transparency, towards freedom of information is amongst one of the most progressive in Europe. So, but unfortunately, the Irish government is proposing to maintain upfront fees for FOI requests and indeed to increase those fees for the more complex requests. This, this is something that has been shown in the past to uh, reduce the number of requests, particularly from the press and from business. And I'm just wondering if the panel could, uh, could offer their opinion to the Minister on these proposals about whether or not we should continue to have fees for upfront, upfront fees for FI requests and indeed whether or not those fees should be increased for more complex requests. The Minister wants to just comment on that first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's be accurate first. There is no proposal to increase fees. There was a proposal to implement the existing law, which was where there was multiple requests that had been disaggregated and that was withdrawn in committee, as you know. Uh, so the question is, and it's, not, it, it's still before committee, whether we should have fees or not uh, as a matter of principle. Matter of principle, I'd have no fees. I'd have no fees for medical card holders uh, to get prescriptions as well in this country. But the country has gone through the most difficult financial challenges. Uh, so, you know, we make rational choices. 78% of all FOI requests are personal information. They're all free. What is consider being considered by committee now is a proposal that there would be, we maintain the existing upfront fee, which is 15 euros, but not have any search and retrieval fees, which applies in many OECD countries, because it's difficult to actually apportion that, that sort of costing. Um, it mainly impacts on the media, uh, it, you're, you're right, in relation to that, because many media queries want civil servants to do their research for them. So, I mean, the default position that we want is open data, and that's what I'm pursuing in parallel, that we minimize the requirement for FOI by having as a default virtually every piece of information we can um, online in any event. So that's what we're, I mean, it's, it's a current debate before Parliament and there's no definitive position in relation to that, but there's certainly no suggestion that the fees regime would be in any way increased. The reverse is what my intention is. Because we're against the clock, I'm going to ask Emily only to comment on this. As former Ombudsman, you had views on, on this. Yeah, I think this is one where I'm not going to wear the, the green jersey. Um, uh, my uh, successor, Peter Tyndall, did have some strong comments yesterday to make in relation to that, and I think I would prefer if he was to okay. speak on that matter. There we will leave it. Thank you very much for your participation. I'm sorry to be uh, running out of time uh, at the end, um, but the conference now goes, goes into breakout sessions, and there are four venues. There are those of you who haven't yet decided which venue you're going to. This is one of them, by the way. Um, there are uh, guides just outside the room here who will tell you where you're going if you have already decided. Thank you very much.